Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, astrophysicist Erica Nesvold on governing space settlements ethically. I often say that science fiction authors were the original space ethicists because they were doing space ethics before humans went into space. It's generally assumed that a lot of these habitats, these space settlements, are going to have some kind of centralized control of things like the water and the air and the food. It's pretty easy to squash a protest or a strike by just turning the oxygen down a little bit. So you can see that there's a lot of concerns for, for liberty and for expressing dissent in a space settlement who deserves to, to live, who ensures the long-term survival of the human race. You're trying to make sure you have enough genetic diversity, enough expertise so that you don't send 10,000 doctors and no plumbers. That gets to a, a whole different set of questions with much higher stakes. Erica, welcome to Chatter. Thank you. I have been a bit of a fanboy for some time. You're podcast, Making New Worlds, and your book, Off Earth, talking about the ethics of space settlements and really all kinds of issues having to do with moving off of this planet Earth are just fascinating and not only take advantage of your expertise, but you also do a wonderful job of bringing in experts from dozens of fields. And that's right up our alley here on Chatter. You yourself are an astrophysicist, right? That's right. I have a PhD in physics. I've done some astrophysics research at places like NASA Goddard and the Kearney Institution for Science. Um, and then I, I left research astrophysics a few years ago. And now my day job is that I work for a video game company that makes an astrophysics simulation game called Universe Sandbox, which is a lot of fun. Dream job, really. Let's go back in time to Erica. And I'm not going to guess or allude to your age in any way, but let's go back to Erica, let's say, 15 years ago. Did you think you would be working for a video game company? I did not. I would not have been just surprised to, to hear my younger self would not have been surprised to hear that I was uh, working in the space world because I was a, a, a science fiction fan from very, very young. Um, but, uh, but when I got the job in the video game industry, uh, I was surprised and many of my friends and relatives were surprised and some of them were very jealous because they were actual gamers and uh, I just sort of fell into it. But it turns out it's a it's a really great industry, at least my little mm -hmm. corner of it, and I, I love the work. That is amazing. So how did you first get into, uh, well, ast I won't say first astrophysics, but first having an interest enough in either space or science um, or you know, what was it that was your gateway drug into what you're doing now? Oh, Star Trek, of course. I mean, that's the answer of many of Original my Original series or Next Generation? or Well, actually, Next Generation started the year I was born, so there you go. Now you have my age. Um, but what I really grew up on um, was Star Trek Voyager. Uh, mm. But I, mm -hmm. I, I watched all of them, and um, of course, that wasn't my only exposure to science fiction. My mother was the sci-fi fan in the family, and she made sure we were well-rounded. But... Um, Imagining, uh, combining my my love of exploration and, and teamwork and, and science with uh, my love of the night sky, science fiction is, was the place to be. And what I love about science fiction in particular and how it applies to my complicated uh, different places I work now is that um, you can think about all the technical and sciencey details of space, but it also makes you think about all the, the human challenges of, uh, of existing in the world and existing in space. And Star Trek itself is is so fascinating over its long history and different uh, different series of its vision for humanity in space. You know, it's really optimistic in some ways, the Federation of Planets, and we've eliminated war mostly between planets, and we're out there exploring, and isn't that great? But there's kind of a darker side to the original series, especially in terms of what this final frontier is. It kind of looks a little bit like European colonialism in some not so good ways and imposing will despite the prime directive. And then you get the more optimistic next generation in many ways, more optimistic about governance. And then it kind of goes backward in a few series where, and to me, that's, that's interesting. And, and we've had uh, Stephen Dyson on here talking through some of those issues. The fact that uh, when Gene Roddenberry was kind of, you know, done with, with setting the agenda that they could explore some of the, those most interesting human dimensions, including issues of governance and ethics. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'll, I'll add to your list that Deep Space Nine did a really fascinating exploration of, of war in particular. Um, but uh, yeah, Star Trek's not perfect. And in particular, Star Trek's been along, around long enough now that it really helps us trace um, the public's attitudes towards science fiction and towards the idea of space exploration starting from the 60s. So so many decades of, of that as it's evolved. Um and, uh, and when I like to, one of the things I do with my work with space ethics is look at people's arguments for settling space. Mm-hmm. And it's really uh, an easy step from that into looking at the way that we've written science fiction, the way that some science fiction has been uh, amplified and celebrated and some has been suppressed or ignored over time and how that, uh, what that really reveals about our own values and the way that we see the world. It is funny. And th- this probably is a foundation for a lot of what we'll talk about here, but so much science fiction has an assumption, not not even a, I'm not sure an explicit assumption, sometimes it's just buried underneath that, well, of course, humans will explore and settle space. Like it's, it's not the fundamental question. It's, it's almost as if, well, the audience will take for granted that that's what's happening in the future. And that's even before things like the space program, the moon landings, even some of the older sci-fi was very much of, well, of course we're going to do this. How would we not do this? And some of the more interesting stuff having to do with it now is exploring the, okay, what are some of the fundamental tensions of even choosing to go and try to have a sustained effort to settle space? Yeah. And I think, again, that that reflects all of the other struggles and arguments that we're having now and, and we're having back then. Um, certainly, early days of science fiction reflected cultural attitudes at the time. And in particular, American science fiction has always reflected our American mythology and our narrative about ourselves, which for a long time was very focused on the idea of manifest destiny and, right. and colonialism and, and building a land of freedom and, and all those things. And uh, and you can see those myths reflected in things like Star Trek, which was, of course, originally built as a wagon train to the stars, wagon train being a Western at the time. So it grew out of these Old West mythologies. And nowadays, we're really doing a much better job of, of questioning those mythologies. And you're starting to see that in our science fiction as well. Right on. Well, for, for listeners uh, who are kind of scratching their heads a little bit, um, for longtime listeners, you'll notice that this episode pairs really well, like like a fine wine and good cooking. It pairs really well with the episode that Shane did with Lucienne Welkowitz not that long ago, maybe a year and a half ago, if, if memory serves. And in that conversation, uh, they really explored the issues of a lot of the things we'll touch on, but especially the issue of going out and exploring and the ethics of space exploration and making sure that your, your probes aren't contaminated and trying to figure out some of the human issues with first going into space. Um, we're going to focus a little bit more on living and thriving in space as a polity, you know, some kind of space settlement issues. But I think we'll probably have a lot of crossover. So I will refer people back to that episode as well. And I must mention that you and Lucianne founded the Just Space Alliance, if I remember correctly. That's right. We are colleagues. Um, Lucienne is also an astrophysicist, and they've been thinking about a lot of these same sort of ideas about um, really examining the narratives around the, the, the latest generation of, of enthusiasm for settling space and space exploration. And Lucienne is in particular an astrobiologist. So they thought a lot about the, those, those sort of topics. And uh, we met at a conference that Lucienne was putting on in D.C., and we decided at the end of that conference, which is a really excellent conference, to... Um, formalize some of the conversations we've been having. And so we co-founded the Just Space Alliance, which is a nonprofit with a mission to advocate for for a more just and ethical future in space and to, and to also harness people's excitement for space to get them to think about problems that we're dealing with here on Earth and maybe consider radical solutions to those. What kind of support do you get? Or more broadly, what kind of interactions do you have with some of the uh, space industry that has really ballooned in the last five to 10 years? I have to say, I was really pleasantly surprised. So my my first uh, interest in space ethics came out of my frustration with some people I had met in the private space industry. Uh, It started around 2016, so space mining was a really big topic of conversation. And I was was disappointed when I would talk to them. I felt like they weren't um, 
thinking about the potential humans, human and social problems that they might run into as they try to start up space mining or go live in space. They were just focused on the technical problems and, of course, the, the business case, the financial problems. And so um, I started learning about these myself and talking to experts um, in the social sciences to, to talk about these topics. And I was worried that because my thought process had grown out of criticism of, of this attitude in the private space industry, that I'd face a lot of pushback because nobody likes getting criticized. But I've been really pleased, especially after we started the Just Space Alliance, to find that there are so many people in space science and in the private space industry and in space agencies who want to do their work in, in a just and ethical way and mm -hmm. recognize that they're not quite sure how to do that because, you know, most of us STEM trained people, especially in the States, we don't have a lot of formal education in ethics or philosophy or, or the social sciences. And so we've had a lot of great contacts with people reaching out to us and saying, we want to do this right. Connect us with the people who can tell us how. And the Just Space Alliance that um, you work on and Lucienne has had in, you know, their conversations with others, it, it's part of your, in a sense, wider mission of science communication, space communication. Talk about the various things you do to try to get these issues out there, to get people thinking about some of the things beyond, like you said, the business case and the technical challenges of, for example, getting to Mars or mining asteroids, but asking the, the ought question instead. Yeah. So uh, as you mentioned, thank you for that. I, I published a book this year called Off Earth, Ethical Questions and Quandaries for Living in Outer Space. And that grew out of a podcast I had made called Making New Worlds that I made back in 2017, 2018. And uh, because I have talked in a public way on podcasts and, and public books um, about these issues, I've had people tell me, uh, give me great compliments indicating that they thought maybe I'd invented the field of space ethics, which I absolutely have not. There was so much work that I've drawn upon and people doing fantastic work. But what I've noticed is that a lot of people doing this work, they're philosophy professors or um, scientists working on, on the technical sides of the fields. And there's just not a lot of public communication about these issues yet. They're starting to be more and more. There have been a couple of other great books that came out this year. And so what I realized is I I wanted to, contr my contribution to this, uh, this problem in the field of space ethics is to, yeah, sort of position myself as a science communicator, except instead of science, it's, it's space ethics. And so one thing I like to do is talk to all of these experts. And when I say experts, I mean people who maybe have never even thought about their work in the context of space before. People like colonial historians or sociologists or philosophers um, and get them to uh, think about the problems that we'll face in space and give us some advice um, from history and from all these, these great fields so we don't end up just repeating the same mistakes over and over again. And that's also the kind of work we do with the Just Space Alliance. We're not there to tell everyone, here's how you do space ethically. Instead, we like to serve as a hub between the people who do have questions about space and ethics with the people who have just this wealth of, uh, of knowledge and expertise and can give advice. That's fascinating. I mean, the, the, the challenging thing about ethics in general that, of course, applies to all these questions is that th there isn't necessarily the right answer. Often ethics, uh, it's a you know, it's an ethical dilemma. There is a choice to be made between something that has values on both sides, yes or no, and it minimizes values, whether you say yes or no, and you have to rack and stack those values against each other. Um, if it's a clear right, wrong issue, then it's pretty easy. You don't do the unethical thing. But so many of these questions are, it's a balancing test. And those are just inherently hard because we weigh different values differently as human beings and as groups and as societies, depending on our identities, our affiliations and our experience. Yeah. And this is really one of the challenges I see when I try to bridge this gap between um, technical people and, and ethicists is it's not just a matter of, oh, you know, read an ethics textbook and you'll be able to, to make ethical decisions. It's a it's a different way of thinking. And that's true for fields like like history and, and sociology as well. Um, it's it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of arguing. And it takes some time. Uh, I haven't even spent enough time doing this. I don't consider myself an expert in philosophy by any means. Um, and you see with scientists in particular, 
people who are trained in STEM, engineers as, as well, we because we didn't have these classes at school, because we haven't had to practice these skills a lot, uh, I think it's part of the reason why a lot of technical people end up just as pure utilitarians, the kind of philosophy where you're just trying to maximize lives saved. Try to make an equation out of it. Exactly. You turn it into math, you know the right answer. Boom. Easy. But of course, um, that's not how, how ethics or morality works unless you you absolutely believe in pure utilitarianism, which has a lot of problems in it. Um, it's, it's more complicated than that. And it's just as much about the process of consulting with different groups and stakeholders and effective people and, and having the conversation and the debate. That's just as important as the answer you decide on at the end of it. Mm-hmm. See, I come at this from a, a different angle, I'm, you know, sci-fi fan as well, but political science. And I did not choose to make my area of study uh, space politics or applying political science to possible futures of, of settlement. But I kind of regret that choice now because, you know, in the alternate universe where David is doing that, um, I'm having so much fun right now because there's so much more interest in the topic than there was decades ago uh, outside of sci-fi itself when people like Isaac Asimov or Arthur C. Clarke were writing books that essentially were talking about governance structures and politics and societal trade-offs, but everybody was wowed by the technological references and kind of glossed over some of the, the things they were talking about in terms of everything from planetary governance to galactic governance. But it's it's really a fascinating issue to look at how, how much goes into governing, um, because apart from what I'll call pure administration, which is literally, you know, balancing spreadsheets here and there. Any choice in governing involves ethical choices. You, yep. you have to understand ethical trade-offs. And, and if you don't, then you might regret it later. And regret is a is an expensive emotion. So I want to jump into some of these because it's it's always good to think about these things before we we do the planning and maybe we can help people get ahead of it. Um, all of it starts with with why we choose to settle space because the reason why you're choosing to go actually can point you towards one or more governance structures more heavily than others. You've broken it down fundamentally as it can be we're, we're expanding because it is our destiny, the manifest destiny, the wagon train you talked about. It can be because it is progress, because that is human growth in one of several areas, or it's mere survival. And both fiction and nonfiction have explored each of these, but I'm hoping you can describe the logic of each of these because I think they do point to different governance modes that we'll be talking about as we go forward. So destiny, progress, and survival. Yeah, so this is uh, the way I, I start off the book, really, um, after I think I explore the question of should we be doing this at all, which is also a, a conversation worth having. Um, but I think it's really important for us both as a society, as, as, a, as, as voters or, or whatnot, um, but also as individuals to figure out why exactly we want to do this. And oftentimes I have to say that uh, people's stated goals for why humanity should settle space aren't entirely in alignment with their own personal goals for why they think uh, that they want to settle space, which is interesting. Um, and the reason I think is, this is so important is not just because it's interesting, which it is, but because which argument you pick is going to affect the decisions that you made, both in terms of governance, but all the other decisions I talk about in the book. And so um, certainly one of the narratives I, I picked up on pretty quick, and this has been studied, this has been going on since before I was born, is the argument of, of space as our destiny. Um, you can trace this back to something called Russian cosmism and, and Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who, who was the, the father of rocket science. He and many others since then have argued that it's just humanity's natural destiny to explore, to go out into space. Um, Carl Sagan would talk like this sometimes. Um, Lots of people um, in science fiction. Um, certainly, there's a there's a sense of it in um, in Star Trek and, and the Final Frontier and and our voyages to go where no one has gone before. And um, and so part of the reason that one's popular is just because it's emotional, right? It gets us excited. It makes us proud of ourselves. It really taps into a lot of American culture about how how our destiny is is manifest destiny to go out and spread democracy and build new new things and make a better world. Um, it also has a weird and perhaps uh, a darker component to it, which is almost a lack of agency. Like, well, we can't control it. You know, it's destiny. We, we have to do it. And, and that can 
subtly encourage people to overlook some of these ethical questions because it's on autopilot that we're going to do it. Absolutely. A certain sense of inevitability. And there's even some uh, arguments in this direction that try to come from a scientific direction, arguments that it's genetically that humans like to explore and migrate around. And they point to human history and say, look, we migrated across the earth. Therefore, it's obviously just our our natural uh, tendency. And a couple of logical problems with that. One is the uh, the fallacy that says something is natural, therefore it's right, morally. Mm-hmm. That's 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 a logical fallacy. And also um, you can look into, you can really dig into these ideas of whether it is built into our genetics a lot, like many mm-hmm. medical science things. There's still a lot of comp- um, confusion and complication there. And then I also like to point out that all the humans that migrated across the earth also left plenty of people behind. Um, humans don't all 100% want to go out and live on a frontier. Many of us like to build better places where we are. And that'll be true even as humans go into space. You know, I would love, and you probably can connect me with the, the right anthropologist, historical anthropologist, because you know everybody in every field ever. But <laughs> I, I I, I would like to talk to somebody about the actual data on that, like to the extent that we can do it. Um, can you discover across all of human civilizations how many people have stayed put? Because history is written about the adventurers most mm-hmm. often, right? It's a, it's a common problem with history is we don't get the story of the average woman and man living in place X. You get the story of Drake and Magellan and Ponce de Leon, and and they're out there exploring and traveling. And those are the stories we read about. And you ignore the literally millions of people who were not doing that. Yes, there are mass migrations, entire populations, entire cultures do move. But there's a whole lot of period of hundreds, thousands of years when populations basically settle in one place. And I wonder if data would help break through this mental mindset that we are genetically determined to expand. Yeah. And and maybe what we need is more cultural appreciation for the people who do stay put and try to make their, their hometowns better places. Um, uh, this is all sort of related to, to the second point you mentioned, the second uh, category of reasons people give when they're talking about settling space. And that's the idea that uh, we need to expand at, for the sake of progress, because progress is necessary. Um, and this gets into to some interesting economic art debates that are happening today, uh, because we measure our economy today based on how fast it's growing. And many people are really starting to loudly point out that you can't grow forever, especially when you're stuck on one planet. Um, and so we need to figure out how to measure progress in a way that's not related to to growing our population, growing our economy. Um, but there's still a very entrenched idea that progress is vital and that if we don't progress and thus expand, because we all recognize we're on a finite planet, that we have to expand into space to get more research sources so we can grow. Because uh, some people even argue that, that culturally we will stagnate if we don't continue growing and expanding, which I, I find to be a very strange argument <laughs> because I think there's plenty of ways for, for life to continue and for interesting discoveries to be made without needing to grab new territory all the time. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but this is a very, very entrenched idea. And, uh, and you see this a lot, especially underlying the destiny argument. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, aside from these more cultural arguments, there's a very common argument that we are stuck on one planet. Uh, we know that bad things and extinctions have happened to this planet before. And so in the interest of ensuring our long-term survival as a species, we should not put all of our eggs in one basket. We should become a multiplanetary species so that if one of those planets gets hit by the next comet, the rest of us will survive. Um, this is the argument that I find most convincing, um, but it's also kind of a dangerous one. Uh, I've the, the pushback that I have received from people in the space settlement advocacy community or, or in the space industry are the ones who really buy into this idea. And it's dangerous because at that point, what you're arguing for, what your values are based on is the survival of the human race. And so it's really easy to fall into the trap of saying, well, anyone who argues against my plan mm-hmm. to settle Mars uh, wants humanity to die out. You know, the stakes get really high at that point and the, uh, the emotions and the arguments uh, get really heightened. And the perceived need to address all of the hardest ethical questions goes down for some people, right? If exactly if the most important thing is that humanity survives. And and that is compelling at any cost, upon right? At that point, yeah. you know, yeah. you're willing to do anything for that person. Right. Um then at that point, authoritarianism, fine. 
um, you know, complete absolute dictatorship and 100% exploitation of uh, the weak or the underprivileged, not only fine, but maybe good if it actually helps some humans survive, peak predator. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a very, very dark future. And then it raises the issue, well, why is humanity surviving at all if we're you know, only able to do it by bringing forward the worst of our history, then is that something worth preserving? And, and those are the hard questions that I think are too easily glossed over when people say, well, we kind of need a backup planet um, because something could happen to this one. Um, but what kind of planet do we want? And is any humanity worth saving uh, no matter what? Those get to some really interesting, fundamentally political and social questions. Absolutely. And this is all very adjacent to, to something called the, the long-termism movement um, mm-hmm. and, and um, related to the effect of altruists. There's, mm-hmm. there's a whole community of people who really go far in the utilitarian direction. And they say that their whole goal is to get as many happy humans in the universe as possible. So they're very mm-hmm. pro-space settlement um, and they're very uh, pro AI and computer development, because they think that the ideal yeah. future is all of us upbra- uploading our brains to computers, and that's how you get right. happy human minds. It gets bizarre when you start extrapolating <laughs> far into the future. But one problem with that is that these people, as they make these philosophical and very mathematical arguments, argue that they're willing to accept quite a lot of bad things happening in our times, mm-hmm. as long as a ha- enough humans survive to rebuild society. Right. Um, and uh, that leads to some uh, very unsettling conclusions. And I think this is an area where, uh, apart from the work you are really pushing now, some of the best work on this historically has been fiction. I mean, I hate to say it, but Isaac Asimov's Foundation series explored the issue of what does the survival of humanity mean? And what, what about the knowledge and the best of humanity being preserved when we know catastrophe is coming? Uh, Dune explored it. In, in a different way. And that one without computers, you know, hum- humanity means not being enslaved by computers. Um, so they, they, they explored this in different ways going back, you know, before our lifetimes. And then now I think in some ways, the actual academic fields are catching up and, and trying to apply expertise to these issues that ethically have always been there, and they just have a new domain to be applied to. Absolutely. I often say that um, science fiction authors were the original space ethicists because they were doing space ethics before humans went into space. Um, and I, I will say that I'm sure there were scholars studying the, these ideas uh, back then, but they, they weren't doing it in anything close to an applied way because we didn't have to make these decisions in regards to space yet. But of course, again, all of these are just a mirror for the kinds of conflicts and debates, uh, and deep questions that humans have, have been grappling with for a long time here on earth. Mm-hmm. Okay. So moving forward, um, if you decide we, we need to go, we're going to have to figure out, you know, what kind of society we want, but a society is, is nothing by itself. Society is people and, and individual choices. So, so you need individuals to make up the society. And sure enough, back in 2016 or 17, I can't recall, but NASA did seek applications for the astronaut core. And about 18, 19,000 people applied, including you. Yes. Uh, tell, tell me why you applied and what that application process was like. I've applied to be an astronaut twice, both times since I became eligible uh, that they've, they've opened applications, haven't gotten past the first stage. NASA, if you're listening, call me. Um, but I applied because, um, because I would love to go to space and I would love to do, uh, the really fascinating work in space that people are doing on, for example, the space station. Um, but I was one of, uh, of 18,000 people. I think it was 2017. And I think they selected eight astronaut candidates out of that class. Wow. Um, so NASA has the luxury and the challenge of having so many extremely qualified candidates, way more people than they could ever afford to put into space. And so they have to pick amongst them. Um, And NASA has been making those decisions since they started sending humans into space. And initially, as most people know, they they really had very narrow selection criteria, right? It was mostly initially it was test pilots, which Mm -hmm. at the time in the 1950s, that was going to be white American men for, for the most part. Um, they've slowly been expanding that demographic range over time. And they have a much more diverse pool. They haven't 
at all caught up to, to even things out over their entire history, um, but they are trying to, to, to get more diverse in order to get you know, the, the best qualified candidates. But as I, as I explore in the book, and one of the, the most fascinating parts of this question to me is uh, that NASA still has a really strict uh, set of physical requirements, right? So they, they want to make sure that the people they send into space are healthy, partly for ethical reasons. They don't want to send someone up there who's then going to need uh, dialysis or something that they can't get in space. But also they have very strict uh, requirements in terms of physical ability, which people are really starting to point out is a bit odd. You have to be within a certain height range. You have to have all your limbs. You have to have all of your senses intact to their specifications. And a lot of people are starting to point out that um, we actually need to start thinking about disability in space and disabled astronauts in space, because the farther away from Earth we send people, the more time people spend in space, we're going to have disabled people in space. They're going to get disabled in space. Yeah. They're going to be born in space with some kind of disability. It makes a lot more sense to figure out how to make our space technology, our, our spaceships and our habitats, make them more accessible so that we can include uh, those, those future space travelers. And at mm -hmm. that point, you might as well let disabled astronauts into your space corps today. And there's some really interesting work happening right now. With, uh, yeah, with it's logically astronauts. untenable to assume a priori that a disability on Earth is a disability in space or on another uh, planetary or uh, any other settlement. Um, when you think about, for example, zero gravity or near zero gravity, um, honestly, some people who are disabled are better prepared for that environment in some ways than than others. So that's a criteria that I think I struggle with this, like on that and the bias towards test pilots who at the time were men and either exclusively or completely overwhelmingly white men. Um, I'm like, oh, wow, that that set that there's a lag effect to that, mm -hmm. because even today, people grow up, the kids in, in school read books that are primarily showing pictures of astronauts that are white male test pilots, even many decades later. Uh, on the other hand, the decision at the time, you can understand that, of course, they were choosing test pilots because that was the nature of the program. And that was the closest thing we had to what they were going to be doing. Sure. But um, and, and this often happens when you talk about diversity in any field is you can point further back in the pipeline. It wasn't NASA's fault that all the test pilots were white men, but because they wanted test pilots, that's the sort of filter they got. And it's very similar problems. Uh, in, in all kinds of hiring decisions and, and questions. Um, this question also gets tougher the farther along in the future we think about it, about who we want to send to space when we start thinking about space settlements and having the next generation be born in space. Um, if you're sending off a big group of people far, far away, you want them to make a permanent settlement, so you want them to be able to reproduce, then you start having to think about the diversity of, of your settler population in other ways, the, their genetic diversity, their uh, each settler's interest in having biological children. And so that can get to a lot of complicated questions in terms of what kinds of people you're filtering out unintentionally, what kinds of people are valued in a society. Um, this very short step into a conversation about eugenics from there. And so we're going to have to keep thinking about these questions uh, as we, we send more and more people into space for more and more different reasons. I think here about something, uh, this is how my mind works, you know, tangents of tangents, but I think here about there's this YouTube, I don't know if it's a subculture, but it's at least a video series called All Tomorrows about the future of humanity. And it explores, you know, many, many thousands of years in the future and how in this, I guess, fictional representation of how it could happen. You know, humans go and then there's a war between planets and then some humans go and consciously at that point uh, change their genetics so that they can do this. But then an alien species comes in and it ends up manipulating the genes and creating all these bizarre life forms. And then tens of thousands or a million years later, some of them survive, but what have they become? Um, and we, we still have this idea of humanity is going to somehow be stagnant in terms of rec even recognizable in the future, when a lot of evidence suggests that life in any environment other than this nicely protected little planet we have, it is going to alter us in ways that we can't really predict yet. And making assumptions about who is best placed to survive that is really projecting our own insecurities about our ability to survive things here on this protected planet. 
Uh, that's a, an excellent point. I'll also point out that we're continuing to evolve even on our nice uh, pr- protective planet here, right? Humans a uh, million years from now will look different than humans today, uh, assuming we're still around, even if we stay on this planet. Um, the other thing I think is interesting um, about the idea of, of creating these fairly isolated communities, because for a long time, as far as physics understands it, um, it's going to be hard to travel between Earth and anywhere that you're, you're building an outpost. It's going to be a long delay, and there's even going to be a communications delay. Yeah. So not only will there be eventually physical changes over time, but much more quickly, our, our culture will evolve, our value systems, our language uh, yeah. will evolve in different ways, uh, as it always has, as we've traveled across the face of the Earth. And I find that really exciting, um, yeah. because more more diversity is, is great. Yeah. And, and, and in fun ways, I think, God, it's been years now, but I think one of Asimov's books had a planet that, that we had, we humanity had settled where they had a strong cultural aversion, uh, almost a, a sickening reaction to face-to-face contact mm. because there were so few of them on a very large planet and everybody lived, even intimates lived in a virtual environment. And when they had to get together to reproduce, it was a physically repulsive thing because of the culture that had grown up around face-to-face contact. And and that's just a science fiction portrayal of like one step from now, like getting to a planet and starting one culture, much less something that evolves over over thousands of years. So let's let's say, and I think we'll agree on this, that it would be unethical at this point to solely select white male test pilots um, for all space settlements from, you know, forevermore, then that raises the question, how should we select settlers? There are, there are many different ways from the random lottery to very finely tuned ones, but it could be many things. Walk through some of the ideas for how we can select different settlers going to space. So again, all this comes back to the idea of what is the purpose, what is your goal in the space settlement to begin with, right? And uh, and this is actually an interesting conversation that's happening today, even though no one is, is seriously talking about space settlement happening in the next few years, uh, because of the growth of the private space flight industry, we're starting to see some alternative selection criteria be presented, right? Uh, these private space companies, you don't have to go through NASA's process, uh, the selection process, you don't have to meet their criteria, you don't even have to meet their physical criteria. So we've had more disabled people going to space in recent years than we have before. On the other hand, the private space industry has its own selection criteria. You have to either be able to afford a ticket or be picked by someone who can afford a ticket for you. And so that's its own kind of filter. So as we imagine, uh, as we will right now, some sort of hypothetical space settlement, let's say it's on Mars, The way that you're going to pick who you send there really depends on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make a ton of money and build a a mining outpost, then you're going to really select based on the qualifications and expertise uh, of the people that you're sending. That is going to add some some other filters, as we talked about, because uh, it's not that everyone in, in the world has the same access to education and expertise, right? So that's going to increase the filters. If you're going to talk about some sort of uh, resort, some vacation resort on Mars, that's going to be uh, filtered based on who can afford it, um, which leads to some interesting questions. One of the earliest um, topics I read about this subject of space ethics was someone criticizing Elon Musk's plan to send a a Starliner, a sort of luxury space liner to Mars, full of the first batch of settlers who had all paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars a ticket. And I was reading uh, the writing of someone I think named Nicole Diker, who was pointing out uh, that your your space liner and your pizza joints and your bowling alleys are going to need people working in them. So if you're going to take rich people to space, you have to take workers mm-hmm. as well. And so how do you select those workers? And then if you're creating a space settlement because the the comet is coming to hit the Earth and you're, you don't have a space liner, you have a lifeboat, then you get into a completely different set of ethical questions. Yeah. Who, who deserves to, to live? Who uh, ensures the long-term survival of the human race? You're trying to make sure you have enough genetic diversity, enough representation of all the cultures on Earth, enough expertise so that you don't send you know, 10,000 doctors and no plumbers. Um, so that gets yeah. to a, a whole different set of questions with much higher stakes. I think it was an otherwise horrific movie, uh, 2012, that that had the lifeboats, right? The arcs mm-hmm. going into space. And one of the more interesting 
perhaps the only interesting part of the movie was the the subtext and, and some actual discussion of okay so who's getting on these arcs especially when when one fails the people that were selected for that one obviously the political leaders were on there because they mm-hmm. built them and they said we want to individually survive but then the idea was uh, representation from various blocks around the world were, were on there but that does change if it's just for fun it does change if it's just for profit which was a part of it too so there, there are many ways um, to, to decide. I think one of the, your most interesting observations, and I can't remember if this was on your, your podcast or, or in the book or both, but instead of just thinking about lottery systems or just thinking about the actual skills and experiences, we need plumbers, we need you know maintenance engineers, um, maybe it's, it's about someone's ability to learn and to teach effectively because we are not going to anticipate everything that comes up. We know we will need a widget maker for this and a widget fixer for this. But beyond that, we need people who can adapt. And that may be the most useful skill of all. Uh, Yes, I did make that very excellent point in my book. Thank you for reminding me. Um, And I I do think that this is something that NASA also selects for. They just do it in the later stages when they're doing kind of psychological assessment of people Mm -hmm. is is the ability, the the stuff that's hard to put down on a resume, the the fact that they want people who can work in teams, who can adapt to new environments. And certainly, yeah, when you're talking about much longer term missions, you need people who can learn um, Mm -hmm. new skills quickly and, and apply them under pressure because no matter how much cross-training we do and cross-training is very important you know, you need to make sure you have redundancy for all the skills that you need um you you never know what's going to happen and to ensure uh that your your team has the highest chance of survival right. as possible they need to be flexible because uh, it's going to be a very alien environment that they need to respond to and there's going to be that that I'm, I'm, I'm picturing a spectrum here and there, there's going to be the need for people to understand that it, it's got to be somewhere in that spectrum that's not at the extreme, right? At the extreme is, well, we must have proportional representation of every group on earth, whether it's racial or otherwise. Um, and we won't even take it into account people's training and skills and education. Well, that's going to be pretty hard if you need someone who from day one, literally from second one, can run the oxygen tank. Mm -hmm. whatever that is. At the other extreme, you could say, well, we need these jobs so much, like the oxygen and then presumably water and other things that um, we'll take anyone who has those skills. Well, I really don't want the oxygen maintenance technician to be a psychopath, right? Because that's not going to go well despite them having the skills. So those extremes are out. Mm-hmm. But so both sides have to realize you, you, you can't go that far. But in the middle, there, there are going to be trade offs as yeah. we make these selections. As, as with many of these topics, there's, there's no clear, easy answer, yeah. no, no flow chart you can right. just write down. Right. So let's turn to where uh, we or they will settle and what to do with the resources we find. There, there is some foundation for this, which is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Um, Give a quick overview of what it says and just as importantly, what it doesn't really resolve involving what governments and private companies and individuals can do and own in space. Yeah, so one of the the other urgent questions that that we're dealing with now before we're even building space settlements, um, and something I get asked a lot is is who owns space? Can can a mining company go up and claim a patch on the moon and say we're going to mine this? Um, and at the moment, I, first I'll say I'm not a space lawyer, but I, I've talked to many space lawyers. Um, at the moment, um, you you can't go up and, and claim territory on the moon. And that all comes back to the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which was signed by the world powers during the Cold War. It's actually a very impressive document if you look at it from that perspective. And one of the main things it says is that you can't have any national appropriation of territory in space, which specifically means that the U.S. can't go up and plant a flag and claim territory on the moon, which actually led to some controversy when we did go up and plant a flag. Uh, they had to put out statements explaining that they weren't trying to claim territory by sticking the flag in the moon. Yep. And the reason that the uh, space powers in particular wanted to do that is they'd just been through all of these wars about territorial appropriation and conflicts over land. So they wanted to avoid that kind of, of repetition of that history. What they hadn't foreseen, because it wasn't as urgent an issue right then, is that there would be private 
individuals and organizations, space companies, who wanted to be able to claim territory. And in particular, under the the kind of capitalist system we have right now, in order to um, be willing to invest money to start a space mining company, you want the assurance that whatever you mine, you'll be able to sell and get your, your profit back. And so this is an underlying important piece of capitalism. And so there's been some debate about how to how do we encourage the space industry? There are certainly people in government who want to encourage investment in the space industry in their, in their countries. And they want to be able to ensure that the, that aspect of private property is covered. But that's not really covered in the Outer Space Treaty. There was a later treaty called the Moon Treaty that said no individuals can own uh, property in space, but that was a failed treaty. It's not very popular. And so instead, what we've seen in recent years is more and more uh, national laws, uh, certainly in the U.S. and in documents like the Artemis Accords, which is not actually law, but uh, sort of a bilateral document, um, that argue that, okay, nobody can claim a patch of territory on the moon or Mars, but if they mine the resources out of it, they own those resources and can thus sell them. And they like to draw parallels with um, international fishing rights on Earth. Nobody owns the high seas, but if you go and fish, you pull the fish out, you own the fish, you can sell the fish. And that's the direction that we're heading right now. And then there's the model of Antarctica, where where there's no national... Uh, territories, even though there have been many, many claims that are, you know, really awkward when you look at the maps because of the uh, the longitude lines coming in. It's pie but, shapes, yeah, yeah, it's it's messy. But but to date, uh, we have not had somebody violate that norm and say, "Screw it," you know, the Chilean army is going in and and taking over Antarctica. Um, but there is there are activities there, right? There is there is mostly not entirely, but mostly scientific and tourism. Um, and we haven't had the private companies do what, again, in fiction, uh, so so many times happens in space, where it's that big bad company, whether it's you know Avatar or Blade Runner, it's you know it's some company alien that's that's going out there and doing what it will because it can. At least we have some precedent for that not happening in something lightly analogous to space. Well, and that wasn't uh, by accident. So the, the, the Antarctic treaty system is, is slightly different and also um, really worth studying. Antarctica is a, a great parallel for space, space in many ways because it's a frankly terrible place to live uh, in terms of its inhabitability. Uh, but it's just scientifically really rich in, in value. Lots of scientists want to go live there and study it. And it's also got a lot of valuable resources. Um, but what happened in Antarctica is that there was an Antarctic treaty system um, that first of all froze all of the boundary claims for some some decades, I think, before it gets revisited, including the overlapping claims. Um, but it also included a minerals extraction ban, so companies yeah. legally can't come in and yeah. and mine. And that was the result of a lot of effort by environmentalists. It really could have gone another way in Antarctica, and it seems to be going a different way in space right now. Mm-hmm. But it has given us in a sense, uh, a a test case or a preview of what could happen. And I don't care whether it's on um, a space vessel or whether it's on the moon or Mars or, or Titan or Pandora orbiting Alpha Centauri, wherever it is, if there are people involved that are anything like who we are, eventually there's going to be some kind of conflict. Mm -hmm. It, it need not be physical conflict, but we all know that sometimes conflicts do take that shape and form. Antarctica gives us that case. Um, scientists in uh, the popular imagination are all nerds who get along. I mean, that's that's fundamentally, I think, the representation of scientists in so mm-hmm. much bad uh, fiction. But guess what? Scientists are people first and foremost. And we have had actual altercations in Antarctic research. And we've had to figure out a way of dealing with that. That's... That's at least an example. And we can say, well, in space, we want to do it exactly the same way we handled it, which probably isn't right. Or we can learn from it and say, Here's, here, here were the structures that were in place that were adaptable to the space environment. Let's build on those. Here are the things that really wouldn't be. Uh, we cannot replicate this in space. So we have to find out something and it's best to think about it now. Uh, absolutely. And the other fascinating thing I think about property in space, and one thing that I like to point out to other space scientists in particular, is when we're talking about land use conflicts in space, we we don't just mean 
two different mining companies want to mine the same piece of land. That's that's the, the easy first example I give. But there's going to be so many different people who want different things from the space environment. That includes tourists. That includes people who want to build settlements. That includes people who want to extract resources. There's people who want to extract different kinds of resources. Some people are going to want to put up solar panels on, on mountains to catch as much sun as possible, while other people are trying to mine in the ice out of the crater right next to it, but the mining kicks up, kicks up a lot of dust that lands on the solar panels. So the Outer Space Treaty and, and more recently the Artemis Accords are tr- try to include uh, ways to address these these examples of harmful interference and making sure that we're all going to play nice together. But that hasn't played out yet. We don't know how that's actually going to play out. And in particular, what I like to point out to other astronomers is that space scientists in particular have been spoiled all this time throughout the history of our field because we haven't had these conflicts. No one's been able to go up to the stars and want to use those environments at the same time we're studying them. And now planetary scientists are going to have to start dealing with this. It's not just a matter of scientists arguing over funding. We're Mm. soon going to have to be competing with other non-scientific interests. Uh, And I I often recommend to them that they try to learn from people, from scientists on Earth, including in Antarctica and biologists and and geologists and archaeologists who have had to work out uh, those conflicts here on Earth, because I think there's a lot we can learn. One of the interesting concepts related to this, uh, which does not get around all of these issues, but it presents a a way of addressing them within a legal structure that we are at least somewhat familiar with, is granting legal personhood to extraterrestrial objects, be they the moon or, or asteroids or others. Uh, building on the New Zealand case in recent memory where a river was was granted uh, legal rights and representation in New Zealand courts. Um, has that idea taken off or is that considered too extreme for most people who, who are talking about space settlement? Uh, a little bit of both. <laughs> there are people who have tried to take uh, lessons from places like the Wankanui River in, in New Zealand, as you mentioned, um, in terms of uh, this this accomplishes a couple of things. First, it acknowledges often indigenous worldviews and understandings. They consider the river a person anyway. They didn't need legal permission to to make that uh, that understanding. And this codifies that that worldview in the legal system. And it also, in a very practical way, uh, improves the environmental protection of, for example, this river system because now it's acknowledged as something that deserves protection in court and has. Uh, human representatives appointed to to argue for its interests. And there are people who have been saying we need to do the same thing in space. There's something that you can look up called the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon um, that tries to argue for legal personhood of the moon. I don't think it's gone much beyond that at this point. And I'm really curious to see how this plays out. On the one hand, it's easy to be pessimistic. There's a lot of examples on Earth of humans bulldozing their way into environments because they want the resources there so badly. But then there's other examples like the uh, the mining ban, uh, the minerals extraction ban in Antarctica that I, I learned about and, and that gives me a sense of optimism that with enough interest in environmental protection, um, we can actually put these kinds of legal protections into place. I, I, I love that optimism. And so it, it hurts me to crush it right now <laughs> that for, for every person who is aware of and and is is talking about these the you know the Declaration of Rights of the Moon or the legal personhood of the Moon. There's probably a hundred, you know, libertarian uh, tech bros starting mining companies or wanting to invest in them, saying, if not directly, implicitly saying, you know, first one there wins. And I I I, I get that it, it's based on some I think misunderstandings about some fundamentals of a capitalist development, but I, I understand it. But what I think they don't understand is that environmental regulations are, I mean, all modern governments have some rules about what people can and can't do with and to the space around them. Some are much more progressive, some are much more rudimentary, but they're, they're, it is part of any governance structure in any society is some kind of either you know statute and legislation or just social understandings about what you can and can't do with common space and minerals and materials and and air and everything else. Um, so it seems to me that this idea that, you know, first one there gets to decide what to do with it doesn't really comport with human history, at least modern human history, very well. Yeah, well, this is another thing that gives me optimism is that we uh, these days are 
becoming very aware, and it's constantly in the public conversation uh, of what we're doing to our own planet here, and and the mistakes and the and the ways that the the colonial mindset and the and the capitalist mindset can cause a lot of environmental damage. And so that recognition and the fact that we're at this moment as we speak grappling with the difficulties of making global decisions about uh, a planet-sized ecosystem that will determine the the health and and, and livelihoods of our, our future generations, that I think, first of all, the stakes are very high there, but also uh, any success we have from that will be able to apply to space. So it, so it is at least on the forefront of our minds. And um, unlike people in the past, I, I would argue that we have the benefit of human history to learn from yeah. um, and to, to avoid repeating those mistakes. We just have to put the effort into learning. Right. Um, can you imagine right now, can you imagine a space environment, uh, whether it's a, a planet, a moon or any other object that the world governments would get together and decide we're not going to settle there? And uh, obviously I'm, I'm talking what's possible, you know, Mercury might not be good for many reasons, despite some science fiction that's tried to make that so. But I'm imagining the equivalent of Arthur C. Clarke's monolith builders in in 2010, sending the message, all these worlds are yours, except Europa, attempt no landing there. And of course, humanity goes to attempt landing after landing. But the equivalent of that, of some kind of judgment saying, we, we will enforce the idea that you should not go to this place. Um, obviously, Plans are in train for Europa already, so we've blown <laughs> that one. But is there any space environment you can see that could be, in a sense, an equivalent of Antarctica to an extreme, saying, we will all agree that we need to preserve that because we just don't know enough or it's contentious enough that we don't, we're not prepared socially, ethically, politically to address the issues that will come up if we go there? I think so. And there have certainly been some proposals about this sort of thing that really mm, parallel stuff that, that has happened successfully on Earth. For example, there have been people proposing uh, a sort of park system like national parks to preserve regions of interest, whether that's aesthetic beauty or historical significance uh, on places like the moon or Mars. There's there's a group that wants to preserve um, the first human landing sites on the moon to make sure that the, the blueprints are protected. So that's for yeah. historical reasons, but also, um, you know, just, just parks where people can go take a hike in, hike in their spacesuit and plenty of proposals that we pr- protect areas of scientific interest. Mm-hmm. And this is already in place in terms of our planetary protection guidelines. This is the sort of thing you would have talked about with Lucienne that says, here are some areas where we're not 100% sure or even close to 100% sure that there there's not alien life here, like microbial Mm -hmm. life. And that includes places like Europa. And I think there'll be a really strong argument from scientists for some time saying you can't build anything here until we've established that it's, that it's clean, that it's empty, that it's sterile. And you can bring your earth microbes there at that point. We don't care. But uh, everyone I think is pretty invested in the idea of figuring out whether there's non-terrestrial life out there. So I think that's going to be a strong argument for some time to come. Now, if we're talking about hundreds of generations, who knows, we'll probably use up everything we can get our paws on at some point. But uh, but in the near future, I think that there are still certain arguments that will carry weight in terms of protecting specific regions. Sure. I mean, there's a, there's a segue here to some of the issues, direct issues of governance um, from what you said through the book by Andy Weir, um, Artemis, about the moon settlement, because they did, if I recall, have a preserved area of the first footprints, and it became a tourist area. And it's what drew a lot of people to this. I don't know what you call it, but it's a settlement, the moon settlement of Artemis. But some of that story really develops when it comes to the, the governance and who sets the rules. And the administrator kind of a dictator in part for issues of uh, slow communication to earth, at least not instantaneous. And that's only the moon, you know, we're not talking about a different star system here. Um, But even a relative, what's seen as a near future exploration with limited population, with communication with and transportation to earth, even in that case, you have a very authoritative administrator who's able to do a lot of things on the spot Uh, independently, which has all kinds of implications for some of the main issues of governance, like labor law and crime and punishment and issues like that. Um, Let's talk about those. Let's talk about labor first. So you could see a range 
uh, and as horrific as it is to imagine, I could I could see cases in which you have everything from indentured servitude or even what we would call slavery all the way to full labor rights um, with the annoying issue of how do you go on strike and quit a job if you can't leave the place where you're working. But there are a whole range of options there. And I'm hoping you can talk through some of those and some of the biggest ethical issues that are involved with what we would consider progressive labor rights in an environment that doesn't at least doesn't intuitively lend themselves to them. Yeah, I've I've talked to some labor rights activists here on Earth about these topics. And again, they'll say things like, oh, I've never thought about this in space, but it's kind of horrifying now that you mention it, um, because there's a lot of things about physical things about the, the space environment that will make uh, that will threaten labor rights, that will make workers vulnerable to exploitation. And um, there are so many parallels we can see with human history and, and today here on Earth. Um, and, and I've talked about quite a few of these in, in my book and elsewhere. Um, so for example, just the really harsh and, and downright deadly conditions in space means you have to think about uh, protecting workers from risk, both in terms of instantaneous explosive decompression to the radiation exposure um, and the, the lowered gravity, which could cause some long-term health problems. Is that something that workers are going to be compensated for or protected from? And then another big chunk of this is the isolation, the remoteness, the fact that in every sort of system that's been described to me in terms of how people will work in space, the workers themselves don't have their own transportation. If they quit, if they get fired, if they are being abused, there's no way for them to say, screw you guys, and I'm getting on my spaceship and I'm going back to Earth to get a different job. And this is the sort of thing that has resulted in a lot of exploitation on earth. It doesn't mean automatically that people are being uh, abused if they don't have their own transportation, if they rely on their, their employer for transportation, but it does make them vulnerable and people who are vulnerable, you usually can find an example of exploitation. So we see this, uh, the example I use a lot is in uh, Thailand today in the, the Thai fishing industry. They use a lot of migrant workers coming from, from Myanmar they take their passports. They, uh, they, these workers go into debt in order to to go to get to Thailand in order to to get this job. They get put on these boats. They get sent out to sea, and they don't bring them back for maybe years because they don't have a way to get back themselves. And you can imagine something really similar happening in terms of um, you want to go work on Mars. You want to work in my my mining settlement on Mars because you love space. First, pay me two hundred thousand dollars, and I'll give you a job, and you can work off the debt. And yeah, I'm not going to bring you back to Earth until you've worked out that that debt. And you could see how that could re- easily descend uh, into a lot of exploitation. And then if you ask, well, what can the workers do about it? Can they use the same sort of recourse that they have on Earth, like going on strike, and that leads to a lot of scary thoughts too, because. Um, it's generally assumed that a lot of these habitats, these space settlements are going to have some kind of centralized control of things like the water and the air and the food. And if the employer or the local governor or whatnot of the settlement is the one that you're trying to protest against, it's pretty easy to squash a protest or a strike by just turning the oxygen down a little bit. So you can see that there's a lot of concerns for for liberty and for expressing dissent in a space settlement. Okay. So I was a bit optimistic in our conversation earlier about the ability, and maybe I'm naive, but about the ability of people to get together and come up with some way of saying, yeah, you can't just go and mine things. Um, We'll come to some international agreement about it. Or even if somebody goes and says, well, I'm the first there, I get everything, and it violates an agreement, presumably the business owner isn't there already, and you can, in a sense, punish her or him on earth, which is a a disincentive. I'm I'm somewhat optimistic we can work out some of that. I got to say on these labor issues, I'm really pessimistic. I would like to believe that all good natured people will go and do this, but some of the structural conditions you've described, the, the lack of an ability to communicate the same way as many, not all workers on earth have, the ability to move somewhere else or to a different job, which again, many, but not all workers on earth have. And then the cases on earth, which somewhat parallel this, which are not encouraging at all, like the Thailand boat situation. Um, Talk me out of my (laughs) extreme pessimism here that the, unless we move to the ideal situation where suddenly in the future, we're all playing harps and philosophizing because we have no need for labor. 
as long as we have a need for labor, how do we get around these issues? Well, I think that you make one good point uh, right at the beginning there that, that I've heard from space lawyers as well, that um, there, there's a lot of narratives that say, oh, these big, big companies are going to go off into space and do whatever they want because no one's watching them and they got there first and no one's going to come after them. But the, as, as lawyers have pointed out to me, and as you just mentioned, most of these companies are going to start with most of their assets and owners back on Earth. And so enforcement of, of international and national law is still going to be able to happen, even if there's no uh, federal agents from the U.S. who are posted out on Mars. Um, so that's that's one small glimmer of hope. Um, the other is that people are already thinking about these issues and they're making some some interesting suggestions for how to try to put as many protections in place for workers and for freedom as possible. One set of suggestions that I find kind of interesting is the technical solution to a social problem, which is always risky, but there have been people, Charles Cockle is one of them, he's an astrobiologist who works on these kinds of ideas. He has suggested designing liberty and dissent into your habitat. So having things like a rule that everyone gets issued a, a spacesuit that they can walk to the next settlement over on Mars so that if they do if they do want to leave, they have their own river, they can leave whenever they want. That makes it easier for people to escape bad situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mentioned before about centralized life support being a risk. Maybe we make life support modular so that uh, yeah. everyone can control their own oxygen supply. Uh, and so there's ways you can design that into the settlement itself. I also think uh, you might have noticed I'm a bit of an optimist, and I'm also an optimist about human nature. I think that there are ways in which the extreme reliance that people in a space settlement will have on each other will, sure, it could make it more likely that they'll be oppressed by someone who takes control, but I think it's also likely it'll make us learn uh, how to build a society where we depend on each other more and and, and have a, a better sense of, of communal effort. So it could go either way. Um, but I think all of this requires that we put the thought and worry and pessimism into effect early so that we can make sure that we fund oversight of labor rights um, right. in, in space so that we have someone there monitoring and reporting back. We can't just assume, um, as some people have suggested, that space will just make us all better people or that uh, labor will be, there'll, there'll be such a labor shortage in space because it's expensive to human, send humans up there that workers will just you know be rolling in luxury because they're so in demand. Uh, I think just sitting back and assuming it's going to work out fine is the worst case scenario. I could even imagine you, you brought up the, and it would be a cost, right, of each person having their own space suit to at least allow mobility if there is a neighboring settlement or a neighboring module. Um, let's take that to the extreme and let's say if indeed there is some truth to the fantastical estimates of the value of mining this asteroid, the, the profits, of course, the expenses are huge, but the, the, the profits would be, would be large. So you say, okay, uh, in order to, to have access to those profits, you must, yes, provide a spacesuit, provide this, but every worker does have guaranteed transportation back to earth. You will pay for it in advance. You will have the vehicles ready. Most of them will remain unused because we're good people. And we do learn that we rely on each other and all the optimism that Erica brings. But to help us get there, <laughs> we, we incentivize it by saying in order to have access to do that, you we will build these safeguards in up to and including millions of dollars of expenses per worker to make sure that everyone has, has, has some kind of incentive to keep getting along. Yeah. And, and so aside from the, the technical and, and cultural uh, ways to approach this problem, there's certainly the legal approaches as well. And this is something I advocate for um, yeah. is, is including regulation to protect workers' rights as well as to protect the environment or mm -hmm. the, the market mm -hmm. or whatnot. And I've been in the room with, with several different rooms at this point with people who try to draw up a certain space traveler's bill of rights and mm -hmm. think about what legal protections we should have for anyone who goes into space. And uh, right of return is a, a big one in there that everyone should have. And this, again, will cost money. You need a lifeboat standing by, uh, essentially. Um, everyone should have the right to return to Earth specifically whenever they want to or within within reason. Yeah. And that, that does make sense. I think just thinking through it initially for moon Mars kind of thing. Once you start talking about a mission, uh, a mission to, you know, the moons of Neptune, or if we ever get there in terms of technology, uh, fingers crossed, you know, getting to neighboring star systems, mm, 
Less at least practical. even with the technology, the foreseeable future, there is no rate of return. There's, there has to be some other fundamental human rights baked into the system mm-hmm. other than your get out of jail free card. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's yeah. a great point. Um, let's talk about crime and punishment, because I do want to believe that, you know, we, if we're on a space mission together, we will all get along and do well, but sometimes bad things happen. Um, if if a criminal in a small space settlement does something uh, truly horrific, something that is detrimental to themselves and the community in a visceral, physical way, but they happen to be the only person or one of the few people who can run the oxygen system, you face a real issue there that doesn't exist in too many ways on earth. We pretend it does. You know, do we do we jail a political leader because they get us through these difficult? Well, guess what? Other people can be political leaders. <laughs> right, right. But that's different than running an oxygen system. Um, what are the what are the extremes of the ethical thinking on that? Yeah, so I found this a really fascinating quote. This is one of my favorite topics that I've, that I've looked into in, in terms of space ethics. And I wouldn't have realized this from the start. But if you start thinking about, okay, let's say we've established whose laws you're following in a space settlement. We've talked about how to protect individuals from the government. How do you protect individuals from each other or, or protect the society itself, the community from an individual who's dangerous, whose behavior deviates from the accepted behavior within that culture, however you want to define crime. Um, We can just default to saying someone has been violent against someone else. What do you do at that point? And uh, so there's a lot of interesting scenarios you can think up right away. What if, uh, for for one thing, who's going to judge their their guilt or innocence? Um, There's uh, often a suggestion that we default to the kind of norms we have here on Earth on ships, um, which is that the captain is the judge in such case. So you can imagine the captain of a space vehicle. Maybe you have some kind of similar leader in a space society. Maybe you've been around long enough that you can set up a full uh, court system with with, uh, legal representation or whatnot. Great. There's still a problem in very small communities where um, there's not a lot of redundancy, as you point out, and there's a lot of interpersonal relationships. So what if the person who's accused is the child of the captain? What if the person accused is the only person, as you mentioned, who is maybe the only doctor or the only person who can pilot the ship? Um, how is that going to sway the, the decision makers? And then once you get past the trial phase, everyone agrees this person is guilty. There's the huge question of what do you do with them? Mm -hmm. Um, And I get two answers very commonly when I start these conversations. One is, well, you throw them out the airlock, which is a ridiculous answer I get so you're often. Talking to the, you're talking to the wrong people sometimes. <laughs> well, I've ta- but the problem is I've talked to science fiction fans, and science yeah. fiction is a huge trope in science fiction that I hadn't oh, noticed until I started having these conversations. But throw them out the airlock is such a common idea of this, quote, frontier justice. Again, yeah. this ties back to a lot of American mythology. Um And uh, it's a problem because I think most people, even if they're pro capital punishment, don't think you should have capital punishment for every possible offense. So you you need another answer. Uh, And the other answer people give, especially Americans, is, well, you put them in prison because that is our default response. We we have a very carceral uh, justice system in the U.S. We, We love our prisons. But there's so many problems with the idea of building prisons in space, both practical and ethical ones. So the practical ones include things like, well, you have to build the prison. You need space. You need to dig out some more rock in your underground subterranean Mars caverns. You need to build another module onto your spaceship. You need the space itself. You need the labor to build that space. You need labor perhaps for guards or to feed the the, and the prisoners. You need uh, extra air and water and food and heat to, to keep those people alive. Um, and you've lost them from the labor pool too. Maybe they were, uh, maybe labor is scarce and you need every single person who can help. Maybe they're an expert and had the expertise you need. And then you can say, well, we could force them to work, but forced labor in prisons is already a huge problem in the US and has been a problem historically. So that all gets complicated. And then there's the ethical problems. A lot of arguments about the ethics of prisons already here on Earth. A lot of people and criminologists and researchers point out that cutting people off from their social connections, a lot of mental health damage there makes it very hard for them to reintegrate into society at the end, which should be the goal. Mental health uh, effects of isolation are already a concern for astronauts 
in general, like just the, the normal population in a space settlement, they're cut off from nature. They don't have fresh air and sunlight on their face. They haven't seen an animal in their whole lives. Now you're going to make that even worse by putting them in a deeper, darker hole. So there's all these, these huge challenges. Um, but this also, I think, gives us an interesting opportunity to explore alternatives. Because as I like to point out, we don't have prisons in space today. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we do eventually have them, it will be because we decided to build them. And mm-hmm. maybe now is our chance to say, well, what else could we do? What what are the non-carceral, non-prison ways that we've, adjust, we've uh, addressed harm in societies here on Earth? And there's a lot of great examples of that. So I find this mm-hmm. a really fascinating subject. That's a good point, is we, we, we think we don't have the case studies yet. We They're very limited, but we do. We have lunar missions with three, often <laughs> three people. Um, who have survived for days on end uh, without having a crime that needed a prison. But then I immediately go to the space station and I go to the fact that you've had crews living together in some cases, hundreds of days. And yes, you've had some, some conflicts, but you've never had anything that I think, unless I'm not aware, anything that rose to the level where people said, we really wish we had a jail cell that we could put someone in. Now, we are talking about limited time. And we're talking about limited people. Um, If it gets beyond that, and it's, uh, I guess, in my mind, it probably gets to when you get above several dozen people who are going to be in a place for a long period of time, it really would undermine the destiny and progress rationales for settlement. If you said, well, first, we have to build oxygen, some way of breathing, and we have to feed ourselves. But the third thing we build is a prison. That really undermines this whole sense that we're doing this because we've made so much progress and we're making so much more. But the issue is still going to come up. And even if it's not because behavior, even if we don't presume that people are inherently bad and are going to attack each other, you raise the issue of what what space can do to mental health. Um, This is in the real world. It's in one of my favorite Sci-fi movies is Sunshine from Mm. about 15 years ago, where I think it plays really well on this idea that uh, madness can affect missions in unanticipated ways. Um, Moon, in some ways. I think this is an area that we have a lot of expertise in a lot of cultures dealing with mental health, dealing with, like you said, isolation and uh, solitary confinement dealing with populations in adverse situations on ships hundreds of years ago. At least we can learn some lessons from that and then come up with something that doesn't involve a prison being the first thing you build after oxygen and food. Yeah. And, and some often people who argue for, for prison abolition, for getting rid of prisons on earth are, are accused of being naive uh, because you can always come up with some scenario where there's some kind of psychopathic serial killer who cannot be, uh, uh, the, the behavior can't be addressed in any other way. And so your choice is between the airlock and a prison. But there's so many other much more common scenarios that we'll run into that we can address. And we've seen societies on earth address this in some other way. A big chunk of, of addressing crime in, without prisons is in prevention in structuring your society in a way that, that, that crime is decreased, which there's been a, a lot of studies on. There's something called restorative justice, which is a big movement in, in the U.S. right now about how to address the needs of the victim and the needs of the society and the, uh, the work that the offender needs to do and how to do all those things without just locking someone up, which doesn't necessarily accomplish any of that. And so I, I think there's a lot we could be learned that at the very least will minimize the amount of imprisonment that we need to do. And addressing mental health uh, just in general and the, the mental health effects of the space environment is going to be really crucial to that process. Yeah. And uh, one thing that I really enjoyed researching and interviewing people about uh, for the book and for the podcast is the idea that there are other non-Western cultures on earth that can give us a lot of insight here that could be very useful in space. Even though there's no cultures living in space at the moment, there are societies on earth that have spent generations living in similar places, not Antarctica because Antarctica doesn't have an indigenous population, but in the Arctic, uh, I talked to a woman named uh, Alice Connick Glenn, who is an Inupiat woman and her people live in the Arctic Circle. And so it gets dark half the year. So they've got that lack of sunlight. Uh, it's very cold. They can't get, they can breathe outside, which is more than you can do in space, but uh, mm-hmm. it's much more of an indoor culture during the winter time. And yet they thrive. They, they're very happy 
in, in at the level that, that all of us can be in our societies. And she pointed out, she gave a great talk, it's up on YouTube, at a Starship Congress a few years ago, where she points to specific things that her culture does that helps them survive the isolation and the cold. And it's things like focusing on community celebrations, uh, mm-hmm. not, not leaving people alone, not isolating people. And uh, I think these are really important conversations to have. And yet another reason to make sure that your pool of people planning and inhabiting your space settlement is as diverse as possible. So that that does lead us to the big question, uh, at least for me, um, again, my political science bias is showing of what form of government is going to be best for a sizable space settlement, um, not a temporary mission, which has many of the issues we've discussed, but something that has all of the issues we've discussed and more, the stuff that comes with any society of size. Uh, and I think this does go back to where we started on the what's the fundamental purpose of settling? Because I can make the argument that if it's about human destiny and progress, then yes, there may be some fundamental issues, including some really ugly ones that are involved with the inherently messy process of representative democracy and negotiation and compromise and coalitions to come up with the best policy. In a space settlement, that has some real drawbacks. But if if we're trying to represent the best of humanity, we live with it. And yep, maybe that settlement fails, but we're failing for the right reasons. Whereas if the motivation is survival, if it's a, a don't look up scenario and we've got a limited or a 2012 scenario, and we've got a limited amount of time and it literally is we want to save humanity. I don't like it, but I understand the argument that says we need to make sure that the gene pool survives. And the most efficient way of doing that in the short term of a large community is through absolute authority. Um, Is there a way around that kind of thinking? Because I could see one slipping into the other all too easily when people build into the narratives you've discussed. Yeah. uh, I mean, again, you make the great point that that, that I agree with that the purpose of the settlement is really going to determine what the best government system is. But even in those cases, it's I think it's impossible for everyone to agree on what the best government system is. If you ask someone what's the best government system for a space settlement, they'll probably describe to you whatever they think is the best system of government, which honestly is why a lot of libertarians are very interested in space settlement. Um, but first of all, none of us get to write down what future generations are going to do to governance themselves. No matter what we come up with now, people who are eventually living in space settlements will govern themselves right, in, in right. whatever way they've, they've evolved to govern themselves. Um, the other thing I'll note is that a lot of people who advocate for space settlement, this includes some, some classic thinkers like uh, G.K. O'Neill, have said that space settlement is great because it, allow, it will allow us to have all of these different laboratories, these social and, and governmental laboratories, you make a bunch of space settlements uh, out in the universe, you try a bunch of different governance systems, and you see which ones thrive and which ones fail, um, which is appealing as a scientist. If you think about it as someone living in one of these failed laboratory experiments, Yikes. it's not great. So I would prefer yeah. not to use this as an opportunity to uh, conduct political science experiments. Um, <laughs> I, I do think we need to put some thought into uh, making sure that whatever systems we put in place initially represent and uphold our values, but also kind of similar to what we were talking about before, that they include some kind of flexibility so that the people who have to live in these places have the ability to adjust uh, and govern themselves. That's, Mm -hmm. That's about as specific of an answer as I can give. Well, to build on that and to build on your, your optimism and your desire to spur these conversations through the Just Space Alliance and your other activities, what can policymakers, entrepreneurs, and anyone interested in this topic be doing now to help set the stage for successful resolution of these ethical dilemmas in space settlements? Um, so I have a whole list of, of answers I give to that question, and they all involve having conversations. So I love ha- giving this list on podcasts because this is the first step is to have these conversations, recognize that these problems exist so we don't just wait until the last minute and realize, oh, yeah, we should have figured out our criminal justice system before this guy punched this other guy. Um, the next step that I always recommend, because this is, this is the first step I took, is to talk to social scientists, uh, us, us hardline scientists who tech people Uh, forget that there's this wealth of expertise out there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We can talk to 
historians who have seen all of this before and can point us to lessons learned and cautionary tales from the past. We can talk to sociologists, anthropologists who can teach us about the state of the art of what we know about how humans live together, how we solve problems together, um, how these humans will act in the future, no matter what kind of systems we put in place for them. We can talk to philosophers, uh, ethicists specifically, who can tell us how to not just give us the answers, but tell us how to think about these problems, how to have these debates. Right. Um, I also recommend talking to activists because these are the types of people who are already going through this process here on Earth. They're thinking really hard and recognizing the social problems that we have today, the human rights problems. They're thinking about solutions that they think would be the best way to address them. And they have great expertise in explaining those problems and solutions to other people to actually, you know, bringing public awareness to issues, doing policymaking and lobbying and such. And finally, I always recommend that um, we talk to people in marginalized communities, both because, you know, there's a very mercenary sort of, well, they can give us tips on how to live better in space that a Western culture doesn't have. But of course, it goes so much beyond that. If, uh, as many people claim, if, if we're doing space, if space is for everyone, if we're doing this for all humanity and all humankind, we should make sure we're talking to all humankind and see what they want from space, see what they want to contribute, see if there's a better way to equitably distribute the benefits that we're getting from space, um, and uh, and see if there are better models of thinking about communities, thinking about how we engage with the environment that uh, that we have not perfected in Western culture. I'll say. Yeah, and and I'm going to add one more that I'm I'm not sure you've said, but implicitly you've said. Uh, let's say that we're wrong and all of these motivations to settle space go away and humanity never leaves this planet again. Having those thoughts, having gone through the exercise of what kind of world do we want if we have, in a sense, a fresh start in so many ways, whether it has to do with uh, political representation, whether it has to do with societal value of uh, every individual, whether it has to do with crime and punishment issues, Having those conversations about space settlements can inform our growth and progress here on Earth in all of our existing societies that, as far as I can tell, aren't perfect yet. And we, we can use all the help we can get. Absolutely. And one exciting thing I found is that getting people to think about these issues in a sort of sci-fi context gives them a certain psychological flexibility that they yeah. wouldn't have had thinking about Earth. I, for, for myself, I would never have really gotten my head around prison abolition as an idea mm -hmm. if I was just trying to think about how to abolish prisons in the U.S. That's a huge, challenging problem. I'm not sure it can be done. But if I start thinking about how I would build a criminal justice system from scratch, yeah. I can think of more radical solutions than I would have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I have here our magical chatterbox, which uh, mysteriously provides a question for you to answer. I hope you have a pic picture of this box on your website because it's really great. In the it's, podcast it's a lovely box. Uh, this one, my grandmother uh, got it in Mexico many years ago, and I don't, I don't know the actual story of why she chose this particular design. Um, the other chatterbox, which Shane Harris, my co-host of some of these, has. Um, is actually from Mauritania and is also a beautiful inlaid box. Um, but I wish we had a better story, like that these were from a space civilization. But Tell a different story every time. That's right. We'll make up one and see who right. calls us on it. Uh, Erica, yes. what book or books are on your nightstand or ah. the Kindle or Audible equivalents yeah. thereof? Um, what are you reading or listening to currently? Um, I am a voracious reader and I just have a Kindle on my nightstand because I carry it with me everywhere. At the moment, I also read nonfiction books on my uh, phone. I just carry it everywhere. So I can tell you by looking at my phone that at mm -hmm. the moment I am reading A Brief History of Equality, which is pretty fascinating. Oh. E econ economics is to me one of my weakest subjects and I've made a lot of economic arguments. So I'm trying to make sure I'm caught up on that. Um, fiction wise, I just read the entire Wheel of Time series, which is a challenge wow, that's an I set investment. myself. It took me 18 months. I just finished Whoa. that. Um, and I was just rereading a really wonderful book that I'll recommend since I just read it, which is a book called The Doomsday Book by Connie Willis, which is fiction about time traveling historians and the Black Plague, which I've been Ooh. wanting to reread, but it was a little bit much during the peak of the pandemic. So I gave myself some time. Wow. That is quite the range there. 
Um, one, one thing that didn't come up here that probably should have, because it does relate somewhat to the issues we talked about. Um, have you read, and we can't talk much about it because I think the spoilers are huge. Have you read the three body problem yet? I've read the f- first one. Yeah. I think I didn't read the rest of it. I thought you were going to say the expanse. Cause that's another series no. I read last year that always comes up in these conversations. I I'm, I'm still holding out on that one. It's on my list and I haven't gotten to it you yet, but the, the expanse. The three body problem was the one that um, I heard for years that you really have to read this book. It's it's yeah. really you know good in different ways than than, but it combines the elements that you like elsewhere. And I just took a while to get to it, and it was only a few months ago I finally got it, and it was one of those where I think I literally did not put it down. I'm not sure <laughs> what happened to my bodily functions, but I, I had to finish that book because it was so mesmerizing and i'm afraid to see the the interpretation of it on screen yeah it is being adapted I hear yeah you. it's but um, the expanse mm, that's the expanse um, that's another one that gets a lot of good attention fantastic yes but in general i'm really enjoying the increase of diversity in science fiction authors because yeah. uh you know most of us started off reading the, the classics which are all just a bunch of white american men and mm-hmm. uh, and there's so many more fascinating perspectives and kate jemison is a fantastic sci-fi author that i've really been enjoying um but yeah. there's some um, Mm-hmm. so much so much out there and, and reading more Chinese science fiction is on my list uh, right on. as well so yeah well Erica um, thank you um, just personally thank you for your efforts in the the science and space communication which is just something I, I feel all of us need more of and it might have changed my life when I was younger and decided to go into something related to the field um, but more directly just thank you for joining me for this extended conversation we'll get this message out to as many people and hopefully direct some people to the Just Space Alliance and some of your other efforts as well. Thank you for this uh, fantastic conversation. Thanks. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter. Chatter.